By the time he had came down and got into level flight, I don't think it was more than 100, 150 feet over my head. It's then that I first saw and recognized that big, round, red insignia there on the bottom of the wing. That and the fact that he's just dropped a bomb has convinced me that these are not the friendly fellows I thought they might be. I turned and hurried back inside the hangar hoping I could find someone with a key to the Admiral Shack. All of our guns and ammunition was locked up and I wanted to get a gun and get back at these guys, you know? But as I come in the front door of that hangar, the other few that I was on duty with that morning were heading out the back door. Somebody, I suppose the duty officer, popped me and said, hey you, follow me. I went after him. I thought, oh boy, he's going to take us out. We're going to get some guns. We're going to do something about this. We're going to put up a defense. But instead of that, he led everybody out to an unfilled construction ditch. They all jumped in. I jumped in behind them. I hit the bottom of that ditch, got myself stabilized, looked up. I'm looking right at a guy there in his dress uniform. The work uniform of the day was the old blue bell bottom, dungaree trousers, and a chambray work shirt. But he was in his dress uniform, like he was either going into Honolulu, going to church or something. Never did find out why he was in his dress uniform. But I'm so thankful that he was, because there, on the left sleeve of that uniform, was a petty officer's rating badge. And I recognized the wing, round, cannonball, the insignia of an aviation ordinance man. I said, you got, you the duty ordinance man? He said, yeah. I said, you got to keep the ammo shack. Well, let's go get some guns and ammunition and shoot these blankety, blankety blanks, you know? So I no more than hit the bottom of that ditch, and I and that ordinance men were on our way up out of that ditch. Somebody, again I suppose the duty officer shouted, get back in the ditch, get back in the ditch! I don't want to be in that ditch, we're military men, we should be putting up a defense, we shouldn't be here in this ditch. Besides, I know that this is the beginning of that war that they've been talking about, and we've been getting them prepared for. And I'm from a proud family, and I damn well know that if I'm going to lose my life in this, or any other battle of this war. I would want my family and my country to know that I died fighting, not hiding. We continued up out of that ditch, started to run for the ammo shack. Then I heard the most unexpected military command directed at myself and that ordinance when I thought I would ever hear, them, especially under those conditions. We weren't running from the action, we were running to it. And I, you know, anyway, somebody, again, I suppose the duty officer shout, get back in the ditch or I'll put you on report for disobeying a direct order. These people are trying to kill us and all we want to do is defend ourselves and he's going to put us on report for doing it? I couldn't believe it. With total and complete disregard for the threat of military discipline, with total and complete disregard for the fact that aerial bombs and machine gun bullets were raining down the air to where we were running, with total and complete disregard for our own safety, we continued to run. We made it to the Apple Shack door, and it's going to lock the door, let himself in. I'm right behind him. What do you want? Give me a 50 caliber machine gun. Now, I'm a recent farm boy. The biggest gun I'm used to firing on a regular basis is a shoulder fired 22 caliber rifle. This was not a shoulder fired gun, this is a fixed mount machine gun. Hell, it looked to me like a cannon without wheels, you know. But I took it as best I could, most likely cradled it in my arms. I wasn't very big at that time. Turned and headed for the door. By now, I guess a few other brave souls figured they hadn't want to be in that ditch either, and it followed us to the ammo shack. The guy coming in the door was someone taller than I, Huskier Bill. I just offloaded that machine gun to him. I said, here, take it to the PBY, park the thing. I'll get the ammo. Oh, he looked surprised, but he took a turn out the door, he went, and I turned around, and there again, I'm so thankful and grateful for that ordinance man, because, you know, without his cooperation, this part that I played in that event could not have happened. I was a boot seaman, he was a rated petty officer, he said, oh, I'm, I'm not going to get out of this ditch, get my kids killed for you or anybody else, man, are you nuts, you know, or something? Anyway, it was like he had springs in his shoes, boy, he was up out of that ditch with me right now, and... Anyway, uh, when I turned around, he was just setting two canisters of 50 caliber ammo up on the counter. I grabbed those two canisters of ammo, turned, and out the door I went. Now, I'm not a runner or a sprinter, but I guarantee you, I beat the guy with a gun to the airplane. We were coming, he had a heavier load than I did. We were coming from the starboard side of that airplane, the same direction that the attacking aircraft were coming from. But the ladder to get into that airplane was hanging from the starboard gun blister around the backside. I ran around the backside, set those canisters down, started up the ladder. I don't think I got more than about two or three runs, 
when it dawned on me, hey, if I get inside this airplane, am I going to be strong enough to reach down and pull that big old gun up inside? I don't think so. So I jumped down off that gun, off that ladder, just as the guy with the gun got there. I said, give it to me. You get up inside. I'll hand it to you. Boy, he chopped, chopped up that ladder, jumped inside, turned around, reached down. I got the gun to him somehow, most likely muzzle first, which is the lightest end, which, which is also a safety no-no. But I don't think either one of us were thinking about safety right at that time. I shot him, put it in a port blister. That's the side they're coming from. He turned and disappeared into the fuselage of that airplane. I grabbed the canister of that ammo in my right hand, guided myself up the ladder with the left hand, set that canister inside the fuselage, back down, got the second one up the ladder, set it inside, jumped inside, picked those two canisters up, stepped this up across to the port blister just as he was swinging that mounted gun out and locking it in firing position. I set the canisters down under the gun, flipped the lid open, took the end of the belt, made a load, thinking he'd have the breech open, but he was just standing there staring skyward. I looked up and here comes another one of those airplanes in a power dive. The same old blinking flashing light. Now I'm only hearing popping sounds, which I would later told were most likely some of those machine gun bullets passing through the fuselage of that airplane we're in. Big old bomb hanging there on the bottom. Boy, I couldn't wait. I just let a guy to get his train of thoughts back together. I just reached over, slid the lock forward, threw the beach open, fed the end of the belt in the loading mechanism, slammed the beach shut, grabbed the charging pin, pulled it back, let it go. Bam, we got around in the chamber. Shoot, I shouted. He pulled the trigger. Now, I think he was one of those guys that thought with a machine gun, you don't have to aim. You just point in the general direction of the target and fire away. Because I stood there and watched those tracer bullets fly off through empty space. I think it's then that my country boy, Hunter Instinct, kicked into gear. I used to shoot jackrabbits on the run, Chinese redneck pheasants on the fly. No, not with a shotgun, with a 22 caliber rifle. I knew you had to put that projectile or that bullet where the target would be when the two of them merged. So I said, hey, let me get the next one. He let that gun down to the rest position, stepped aside. I grabbed it, brought it back up, just as I did. Here comes another one of those airplanes in a power dive. Blinking, flashing lights, big old mom hanging there at the bottom. I got a bead and a lead. A bead and a lead. I continued to lead and I fired away. And I continued firing. Of all the while he was coming down, and when I couldn't raise that gun any higher, I still continued firing until he'd come all the way down, pulled out of his dive, and passed just overhead. I watched those tracer bullets fly through the air. It looked like every one of them went right into that round opening on the front of that old air-cooled radial engine dive bomber and then stitched the stitch right down the bottom of the fuselage. Now you gotta know and you gotta remember, following each one of those tracer bullets, there are four regular bullets, another tracer bullet. So I know here and I know here that I did some da damage to that aircraft, but you're not gonna be watching him because he's going away. He's no longer a threat. You better be looking for the next one that's coming at you. In case any of you haven't fired a 50 caliber machine gun, there's a cartridge. It's fatal over a mile away, and it's fairly accurate. Anyway, I gotta get a drink if you mind me just a minute. I get dry here. Anyway, that one was going away, so I figured he was no more of a, a, a threat to me, you know. So I bring that gun back down. I'm looking for another one, a power dive, but I don't see any power dive. But there, there's one out over the channel, maybe two city blocks away, well within the range of a 50 caliber machine gun. He's not in a power dive, but in a steep banking and descending left turn is where he's good and ready to make another machine gun run on it. Because he's in that banking turn, I can see the cockpit. It's about six or eight feet behind the front of that airplane. I figure at that distance and at that speed, if I use the front of that airplane as my aiming point, I'm going to get some round into the fuselage, maybe even to the cockpit. And believe you me, if you can get a couple of those 50 caliber slugs bouncing about inside that cockpit with that pilot, you're going to give him something else to think about besides coming back and machine gunning you a second time. I maintain that lead, squeeze the trigger. Brrr, I don't think I got off more than about six or eight rounds, but I saw at least two of those tracer bullets seem to disappear into the fuselage of that airplane just forward of the cockpit. And when they did, that airplane changed and did a rolling right turn and was gone from my field of fire. No more aircraft came back to bomb or strafe our end of the island that morning. I stayed at that gun. I got to fire other short blasts at other aircraft as they passed through my limited field of fire on their way or to or from other targets. But no more head-on turkey troops like those first ones were. Sometime later, when the second phase, the second uh, wave of that attack came in, about the same time the USS 
Nevada came down the channel, making a run for open water. Boy, those pilots, those airplanes got on it like a swarm of bees. They hoped that they could sink it there in the channel, and that would have blocked the harbor for some time. I got the fire burst at some of those on their way to it from the Nevada. But by now, our own aircraft parked on the ramps and on the apron and an adjacent hangar, Building 6, Hangar 1, were beginning to burn so fiercely, putting up such heavy smoke, they were between where I was and where the Nevada grounded at Hospital Point. Uh, that, that heavy uh, bunch of black smoke just obliterated that field of fire. I think it was 50 years later, I was listening to a news broadcast from Hawaii. Uh, as a good neighbor policy, I guess they had located some of those Japanese pilots who had actually participated in that raid, who had survived the war, and they had brought them back to Pearl Harbor for that event. And this was on the 8th that they were interviewed, and they asked this one pilot, what part did you play in that raid? Now listen carefully to this. He said, I was the lead pilot of a group of nine aircraft. Our assigned targets were the airplanes and the hangars on Fort Ida. That's where I was. He said, when I went in for my first run, machine gun, dropped my bomb, I didn't see a soul. It was like the whole island was asleep. But he said, we were surprised how fast they reacted. Because he said, by the time I had came around and was lining up for my second run, there was so much fire coming up that I turned and went elsewhere. <laughs> oh, how I would have loved to have talked to him. There's the guy that dropped the very first bomb to fall at Pearl Harbor the mo that morning. That's the bomb that got to me physically, spilt of my blood, surely some of the first, if not the very first, to fall there at Pearl Harbor that morning. But in spite of that, I think I'm the guy, or at least one of the guys, that got to him with that on-target 50 caliber machine gun fire and changed his mind about coming back and bringing his eight wingmen back to machine gun us a second time. 